juxtaposed to what one knows or from a base of comparison that one, I think, simply finds out more about not only what they're studying, but in a sense then redefining maybe what they've studied in the past. And obviously, as Mark said, having now been in Muncie for about 26 years, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out this city, and every, meaning Muncie, and every time I go elsewhere, it, it, sometimes it clarifies and sometimes it mystifies me uh, about this city. Uh, so what I, I'm going to try to do is to share with you a comparison. Uh, sometimes I'm stretching the point because I think you know in comparisons they're never straight line, they're never really apples and apples. Uh, and I think for some of you, especially students, especially maybe in the early years here at this university, you might probably find out as much about Muncie as you will about Oxford because I have found that actually many students spend five or six or seven years here and keep driving out 332 now to 69 and actually know very little bit about the city that, that in a sense is the hometown of the university. So in some ways it's an opportunity hopefully to uh, share a little bit about the history of what I think is an actually incredibly rich history and, and one that I, being a transplanted Hoosier, am actually very proud of because it is a city, as you know, uh, that is Middletown USA. It has been ever since the mid-20s and finally published in 29, Middletown USA. Uh, and interestingly enough, in England, I did not have to give any background. Being so much into social planning, the English knew right away about the Lynns and about Middletown and about, in a sense, Muncie uh, being uh, of the idea of Middle America and its viewpoints, and that I thought was interesting. And the last thing I'm going to try to do is have you laugh a little. Uh, any of you that have traveled, especially with children, you know humor is a very, very good thing to have to get you through uh, some uh, some points of view. So with that, if I could have the lights, or I guess I can do that. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to, hopefully this will all work right, uh, I think it's always good to know a little bit about the names. I think the names tell you a lot. Uh, Oxford uh, is a direct descendant from what was a historical crossing of Oxen uh, or a fording of a river and therefore Oxford. Uh, both, uh, you'll see in here in a second, that Oxford is located at the confluence of the Churl and the Thames. And so it was a natural point uh, ever since really man settled the Midlands for, uh, for that to be a point. Uh, Muncie, interestingly enough, uh, also has its name rooted in the history, uh, namely from the Muncie clan of the Delaware Indians. And so both names, I think, already give you an idea about uh, something about the city. And I'm always intrigued, interestingly enough, as you see, Muncie actually changed its name from Muncie Town by the state legislature uh, in 1845. Uh, and I think one also, if one looks at the crest of a city, one can tell, and these are the two crests, one of Muncie and one of Oxford, and uh, as a student, you can actually learn about the history from, uh, from those uh, in terms of, of uh, what is the derivation of the city and therefore what is the symbol uh, of, the, of the city. Uh, I did not see any oxen crossing the river, by the way, in, uh, in Oxford. Um, these are the two, these are, by the way, how they're used, and I think uh, it's, it's, uh, you can make your own uh, judgment, maybe, about uh, the, uh, the, the uh, use of those, but I think you know that the city seal is used typically wherever a city name uh, will appear uh, for various reasons, but not seeing any oxen, but I think if you drive around Muncie, you will actually see a community's, in a sense, uh, testament to the Indian background, to the Native American heritage of this community. And very interestingly, right now, I would recommend anybody who's interested in that would go to the Minutrista Center because as you can see uh, from the banner on the right there, there is in fact uh, a, a show on the appeal of the Great Spirit or uh, to the Great Spirit, uh, 1908, a replica uh, by the uh, sculptor Cyrus Allen. The original is outside of the Boston Museum of Art and it is in fact a monument dedicated to Edmund Burke Ball. Uh, and I think a very, very impressive uh, uh, monument. There is also uh, another one down uh, town on the Walnut Plaza, and I would tend to think as students studying cities, when one sees statuary, one should take time to find out why the statuary, in a sense, imparts the image that it does. It can tell you a lot about the city. Uh, just for those of you that aren't very good at geography, this is uh, the basic statistical breakdown of the two cities where we're located, interestingly enough, uh, it's very rare that 
uh, Ghetto City so close to the uh, prime uh, meridian, but since uh, Oxford is so close to, uh, to Greenwich, you can see that we're actually just slightly over a degree uh, west of, uh, of Greenwich, which is located right by London. And you can see actually that, that uh, Oxford, England is uh, located, and uh, let me see if we've got this super gadget here, I think. I think we're looking at Oxford right around here, and of course, Muncie right around here. Uh, Oxford's actually further north than, than Muncie by about 10 degrees. And uh, one thing interesting in finding out how to try to tell you their relationship, I came across this wonderful atlas page that shows you all the different ways in which geographers try to graphically represent as nearly as possible the relationship on the Earth, since we're basically a sphere, although somewhat uh, Airline, it is very difficult to, on a flat piece of paper, show relative uh, positions. And I was intrigued by all of these different projections that uh, different geographers and uh, cartographers have developed over time trying to represent the, uh, the globe. The other thing that I just showed is the relative size. One of the things that really was driven home to me is how much the Brits mentioned those that have been in this country, the size of the United States. And I think by just realizing the size of England and the size of the states, it's pretty obvious why many people from Europe are impressed with the size of our, of our uh, nation. And uh, this was intriguing because when we left uh, Oxford on March the 8th, the daffodils and the crocuses were up, and it's interesting uh, if it's uh, 10 degrees further north, why? And I think this shows here that actually very interestingly, Right near Oxford, there is a line that basically does carry the, uh, the warm waters and the warm breezes up. And in fact, the British Isles and the coast of Europe are actually impacted by this. And this, in a sense, gave me the answer when I came home why, in fact, a, a city that is further north actually has a climate that was rather quite mild. In fact, as a runner, it was really enjoyable to basically go out in January and February without the accoutrements of. Uh, weather running. Uh, it's also interesting when one lives in a foreign country, uh, and by the way, this is Oxford, like everything, it's about an hour from London. If you ever ask people where something is, it's amazing how many things are an hour from London, but it is. It's about an hour from London, located up here, uh, basically to uh, the west, uh, slightly north, and of course, one gains a whole new set of numbers. It's really amazing how we, we uh, deal with that. Uh, there are some major interstates. There's an M1 that actually goes up here to uh, Birmingham and is a fairly uh, quick route to get up. Uh, although, interestingly enough, like Muncie, uh, although now we do, Oxford does not have a really good link with a motorway. So one is always dealing with about 10 miles before one gets on to the equivalent of the interstate system. And obviously here, one deals with Muncie. And this, by the way, I know there are some foreign students here. Um, Muncie is located about an hour, an hour and 20 minutes to the northwest of the capital city of the state, obviously London being the, the national uh, uh, capital of, uh, of, of England. Uh, it was very interesting when one, uh, the idea of where one goes to mail letters. Uh, this was our local level. Uh, post office, interestingly enough, you'll see here it was actually also a bank. And this is our local post office over on the west side of town, which is actually Norm's Paint. So to me, it was very interesting that we really, except for central post offices, don't go to post offices per se, but the postal service is very much dealing with part of people's daily lives in which you also transact um, uh, business. And what I also found very interesting are basically how the two countries handle the uh, postal box. Uh, this one here off of Jackson uh, near Tillotson, uh, very much geared not for walk-up trade, but for the automobile. And you can see by where it's placed, its relationship with the curve, that this mail drop is not made for people to walk through, but rather to drive through, saying something about the society in one seat. This one, this wonderful piece of, uh, of I think, street architecture, or streetscape furniture. And what's very interesting, by the way, is, and since we typically now get mail on uh, Petty Road at about 4 o'clock in the evening, um, I'm always amazed at how much pride the English still have in their mail system. 
There are about five uh, pickups here at this box, and the uh, male a man will change the numbers so you know whether you've made the pickup, and he will simply put the next number in. Uh, I thought that was a very unique way of letting the uh, customer know whether you had, in fact, made the 310 uh, pickup. All you have to do is look at that uh, little uh, number uh, up there. Uh, both cities have been greatly influenced by the rivers uh, that they are located on, and basically, as I mentioned earlier on, the very reason for their being. Of course, the White River, which meanders through town, at one time actually meandered through the entire city, but in the 30s, when flood control measures were taken, the city has basically been channelized here, and of course, channelized all along River Road here. If one goes along River Road, one can still see some ponds down here, which were, which are still the remnants of the original, in a sense, Oxbow River uh, as it flowed through one sees a very circuitous pattern. This is the uh, Charwa River, this is the Thames or the Isis, which come down and the confluence is down here, and as you can see, they very much impact the landscape and very much impact uh, for those there. Uh, this is a little bit unfair, obviously the Brits use their river quite a lot in the sports in Oxford. We, they're not doing this now, yet. this is from a magazine picture, but these are uh, punts, which are interesting flat bottom boats, uh, and this is very much kind of a sport, if you will. Of course, there will be a sport here as soon as the weather gets just a slightly bit uh, warmer. Uh, and I, I often think how interesting it is that here's the relationship of the college, the Thames, of course, Oxford, Cambridge, one of the major athletic events of the universities, but I also think it's very interesting for those of you that do not run or, in a sense, engage the river, that we actually have a beautiful river corridor that also runs through one sea and has tremendous potential, uh, in a sense. Possibly not for this kind of recreation, because obviously one needs a pond situation, but certainly, and there are some attempts in terms of uh, usages of, uh, of the river. Uh, the river has not always been friendly in both cities, as these historical photographs show. Here, a flood from 1875, and uh, here, various pictures of the Great Flood of 1913 that not only impacted Muncie and the White River, but actually was one of the largest floods to hit the entire Mississippi uh, drainage uh, uh, basin in the uh, middle part of the uh, United States. Uh, the uh, Thames River, as it runs through uh, Oxford, has been tremendously controlled by man, much more so than the levee system uh, in, in Muncie. And as you can see here, the uh, Thames uh, Conservancy, which was a major, in a sense, river control project, allowing the Thames to be obviously navigable through an incredible series of locks. And as one walks along these rivers, one gets an incredible lesson in hydrology one gets an incredible lesson in the way man controls water because there's this wonderful series of weirs and a wonderful series of locks that in a sense allow the river to be channeled, allow the river to have its, its level uh, in a sense controlled by man and therefore allowing for the river to be uh, usable. When we got there, the, the Thames was in flood stage and it was just amazing to sense the power as this river uh, in a sense is, is held back and uh, maintained at times. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, is the Oxford uh, Canal, which is part of a huge system running all the way up to uh, Birmingham and Liverpool. And um, you can see here this, uh, the wonderful uh, canal boats here. This one owned by a Westminster College faculty member who was nice enough to have us there for a day along with the Cairns, as a matter of fact. And this great, in a sense, man-made water body that runs through the agricultural land with these great uh, bridges that one hops off the canal boat and, in a sense, functions on their own. And there is both a river system and a canal system which are independent of each other, both in authority and, in fact, although one can go from one to the other. Uh, and the river also, uh, historically, has had a commerce these are obviously uh, factory buildings from the late 1800s that use water power taken through sluice waste. It also, I think, is one of the areas where uh, there's been some very, very interesting kind of contemporary architecture building upon, if you will, the, the historical architecture. Although I have to say this one here, which I've not seen yet in the uh, public catalog, uh, is somewhat interesting. I think either there was a window elevation upside down in the construction drawings. Um, 
there's also just this incredible uh, testimony to engineering. Uh, this happens to be the uh, bridge from the late 1800s that carries the uh, Botley Road over the Thames River. It is a wonderful example of kind of cast iron engineering and architecture from the 1800s and a real, in a sense, celebration of bridges as a piece of public architecture or a piece of public construct. Uh, I was really uh, taken not only by that bridge, but by the Mortland Bridge. And this is the bridge that is over the River Cherwell. Uh, and what's also uh, interesting to me is by the bridge, one finds information about it. To me, this is a very important part of uh, public education, raising the awareness of the citizenry and the tourists alike as to, in a sense, the value of that piece of architecture, something that we're engineering, something that I think we need more of, not only in Muncie, but in the United States. And what was most, I think, intriguing to me was the fact that the bridge has basically been falling apart and there's been this wonderful uh, kind of uh, public effort to restore all of the stone uh, balustrades. And you can see that there's just a very small amount left. I couldn't help think um, when I stood there and looked at this great bridge uh, that here in Muncie, we also, very interestingly enough, have the last of the bridges from the WPA, uh, this one carrying the Washington Street uh, thoroughfare across the right river. Uh, and I'm very, very fearful uh, that we will wind up with the Department of Transportation replacement. And I think, as a community, not only do I think we need to be involved in saving buildings, I think we need to be involved in saving landscapes, and certainly involved in saving, if you will, engineering constructs that not are only a record of, in a sense, uh, Muncie, they are, they are really, in a sense, a record of an economic revitalization program uh, that basically changed the whole way that we look at government, the way we look at work programs. Uh, I think very, very important and something that uh, I think Muncie needs to really uh, deal with. So uh, I guess the question then for Muncie is, uh, are we going to wind up with uh, this here, or are we going to retain a piece of our heritage uh, that, in fact, is on one of the uh, sides of the Washington uh, Street Bridge? Uh, the automobile has had a tremendous impact on both cities. And I think you probably know that about Muncie. You probably don't know that about Oxford. Actually, William Morris has had a much greater impact on Oxford as a city than the universities have. And interestingly enough, uh, Billy Durant over here that made the Durant automobile in Muncie in the 20s was the first president of General Motors. Uh, about 20 different types of automobiles were made here in Muncie at one time or another uh, as the great motor age began to, in a sense, uh, develop. And of course, uh, William Morris uh, developed uh, the uh, Morris automobile. This is the original plan where the Morris automobile was r and It is preserved as a museum, very interestingly enough. I had to go back to quite a this book with the Swift collection to find the original plan, no longer extant. And although the name has now changed, you will find the Ram motors up here on the uh, standpipe. Uh, these are all of the different motors that at one time Durant's uh, company manufactured both in Muncie and up through uh, Michigan. Interestingly enough, by the way, the Durant was the uh, pace car, the 1923 Indianapolis 500, for those of you that are. Uh, you can call Donaldson with that question, by the way, when he comes on this year and see if he, in fact, knows where the pace car from 1923 was made. It was made here in Muncie. Uh, and what's interesting is with the Morris automobile, uh, in fact, Oxford truly finds that one big industry that it's always been looking for. And between 1920 and 1930, over 8,000 homes are built in the suburb of uh, Howley, many of them looking like this, the basic or what I would call a duplex, a two-story, two-family house, as basically the motor age arrives and establishes an amazingly strong financial basis for a growing Oxford. What's also interesting and parallel is once you look for one big industry and found it in the five uh, ball, ball brothers who come from New York in uh, 19, excuse me, 1887, established the Ball Brothers uh, company here, uh, a picture of uh, the brothers, and what I think that is a similarity is both cities were looking for this major industrial base. The other thing that's a similarity is both, in fact, um, uh, families, if you will, endow education. Uh, William Morris later becomes Lord Nuffield, and this is the university that he, in fact, finances as one of the colleges of the 
Fox University, and of course you're attending the university that ultimately is the result very, very substantially of the philanthropy of the uh, Ball Brothers. So there's some interesting, I think, uh, parallels that one can find between the development of great industrial families, great industrial wealth, and also, in fact, the uh, contribution of that to, um, to higher education. Uh, roads, automobiles have always played a major, a major, major uh, a role in both cities. Both cities have uh, bypasses, that's what we call ours, the Brits call it the ring road, but basically the whole attempt to deal with non-locally oriented traffic, taking that traffic out and around. Now, what becomes interesting for all of you that have driven in England, of course, is number one, you know, we're driving on the wrong side of the road, or they are, uh, but the other thing you'll notice in looking at this, we're on the ring road here, and uh, we're on the Muncie uh, bypass here, you'll notice besides the different sides of the road, several things. Number one, you will not see a billboard, which I think is interesting, all well, these through drive out 332 as well, and see what that does to our landscape. Uh, but the other thing you'll notice is this very curious directional signal, known as the famous uh, roundabout. It is something uh, that after one gets used to, actually is quite amusing and quite humorous the first time one engages it, and I just couldn't help those of you that have not been, and I hope this, this came out a little dark, it must be something about the darkness of this, uh, but this is the symbol one gets upon exiting, this is the famous roundabout, or as I do, no guts, no glory interchange, because one needs to have a certain kind of driving Elon in order to engage the uh, roundabout, and if one sees this sign here, uh, my navigator, typically my wife and my oldest boy with me, would count the number of exits, because if not, one could find oneself going around several times before one hits the accelerator, hopes like that you've got the right of way and attempts to exit on the uh, right road. Uh, I cannot help when I return to the States just be absolutely overwhelmed leaving O'Hare Airport in Chicago and still, in a sense, thinking about how wonderful it was to drive on a major road in which one could truly appreciate the landscape, uh, the natural landscape, the parkway notion. And I think this is a, probably as good an example of any about what's more important, the signage or direction or the signage itself. Uh, uh, and in terms of street signs, I also simply think it's interesting if one looks at these two, one from the uh, Botley Road, actually, this being a road that intersects with it, uh, just where we place it, the form it takes, the substantialness of it and how readable are the signs. I think that's something else that I think uh, one deals with in terms of, uh, of graphics. And of course, I love the British. They're wonderful with words. These are examples of two different signs dealing with parking. Um, and I was uh, simply enthralled by the amount of information one actually finds on certain signs and one finds on, uh, on other signs if one looks at that. I was also intrigued by parking and so are the Brits and so are us all. This is an honor system. It's basically a pay and display. You come, you put your money in a machine, out comes a little piece of paper and you stick it on your uh, windscreen or windshield. And in fact, I think it's interesting that uh, in the case of Muncie, we deal with a, a, a toll booth, we deal with arms and so on and so forth. I was really intrigued with the sense of, of kind of honor that one does. Now, I did it. I did test the system to see if there is somebody that's going to come around and uh, a ticket your car, but again, one of those things that I think strikes me as a student of how cities, in fact, operate. And one of the things that just absolutely was interesting for me to compare was how we sell our automobiles. This being the local Volvo dealer in Hockley, where and the Mitsubishi dealer is right next to it. They actually fit in under an office building, and of course, this is now becoming kind of our sales role for automobiles. That to me was distinctively different sense of, if you will, how can you deal with buffering and landscaping, but the one that really, I think, was interesting to me was to see used cars. Now, this to me, I don't have to say very much about uh, how we, in a sense, treat used cars here, and this one, of course, is my famous Mount Strobachi. If you drive on 332, you can see the latest car that's very good at climbing the hill. It says something, again, about roadside architecture. It says something about maybe the sense of the quality of the car you are buying as a used car. Uh, transportation is 
very important. Uh, this is the basically the bus station that serves the kind of intercity, uh, uh, excuse me, intercity, uh, and you can see where it goes to. This is the bus station right in the middle of Oxford, and very interestingly enough, from 5 o'clock in the morning until about 9 o'clock at night, we're turning from London as late as 1 o'clock, buses run every 20 minutes. So basically, in Muncie, what is the, I think, pretty much the servicing for the kind of intra-city bus is basically what you can get. It's much greater reliance, much greater acceptance of uh, public transportation uh, in the sense of its uh, frequency. And of course, and those of you that have uh, been there, I think you know uh, that, the, uh, that the symbolism within the bus is both wonderful vehicles, just very different in their symbolism. One of the things that this drives home, and I think this will repeat itself as I continue, is that there's simply greater density in England and greater density in, 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 in Oxford, and this includes the buses where we stack people twice as high as we do in the States. There's, a, there's kind of a compression that one sees uh, very much kind of in everything. Uh, I was also intrigued with the use of the uh, of bicycle and the commitment to it. Uh, in Oxford, there's a tremendous uh, commitment to the bicycle. In fact, there is an infrastructure commitment to it. There's actually curb cuts that are for the bike. This is on our campus here. Very luckily, this wasn't staged. I think this slide says it all maybe about where we ride in the sense of that there is a place to ride and not. Uh, but this is actually on the sidewalk because that's where the sign is, interestingly enough, here on campus. Uh, and uh, in, in, in Oxford, there's a much greater in sense, if you will, formalization of the role of the bicycle, where it goes, and one would never find anybody with a bicycle up on a curb as we do here. And if you did have your elbow off on campus here, you know that sometimes that in fact really does happen. I think the history of the city is very important. I'm going to go through this extremely quickly. These two books have been amazingly helpful, and I would very much recommend this book by Dwight Hoover on the Swift Collection, uh, basically to anybody that wants to study, because it will show you, in fact, that Muncie has a very rich uh, tradition. This happens to be a map of Oxford, a map It's actually a model of the city museum from about the 10th century. Interestingly enough, it does have the grid, the only grid that appears in all of Oxford is from the original gridded plan. Of course, Muncie, uh, from about 1887, right before the founding of the gas, is also a gridded system. And one can see that's about where the similarity will end, because soon thereafter, one will find that Oxford will basically grow totally dependent on a university, so that by around 1500, one finds the university, in fact, an integral part of the system. One in downtown Muncie, by 1910, will not find the university there, and I will speak about that here in a second, but one finds both cities basically growing at a very, very rapid pace. This one about a university community, this one very much about a blue-collar working community. Very different notion of, in a sense, a town-gown uh, relationship. Um, and both cities had skylines, interestingly enough. But for those of you that remember, we did have a skyline at one time that had, in a sense, a sense of uh, hierarchy. And of course, the famous spires of the cathedral, this part of, of the uh, campuses. This one very much talking about a university community and a religious community. And this one, of course, the spire representing, if you will, secular or the, uh, the uh, people. Uh, both cities had a real sense of center. We had the courthouse up until 1967 and the courthouse square. In Oxford, it's uh, Carfax with the tower remaining from St. Martin's, a 19th century, excuse me, a 14th century church. Uh, but certainly, we had that idea in Muncie of a sense of center, and that same sense of center was uh, this I think it's interesting how at one time we did in both cities have the idea that there was a power, there was a sense of verticality. This is a historic photograph, obviously. This is very much a part of contemporary Oxford, a different appreciation, a different use of, obviously, history. I mean, I'm intrigued by these two photographs, one from 1907 of Oxford, one from uh, 1890s of uh, uh, Walnut Street, and I think one can, in a sense, see that really by 1900, the downtowns were quite similar, very much uh, the, the introduction.
reduction of trolleys and rail, the public transit, first horse drawn, and then of course motor driven, uh, but very much both at the same scale, a kind of a three to four story uh, commercial. This happens to be a Corn Market Street, which is a major commercial street, uh, whereas High Street would I think be considered to be the major kind of academic street. Both cities build great department stores, the McNaughton store, designed by um, uh, Francie and Lamb out of Cincinnati in 1903, and a great department store here, uh, the Ellison and Capital store by, by 1835. So, in a sense, the city without the university, there are some similarities that to me are very important, both cities very much being, if you will, of the, of the day. The department store, of course, was in fact a whole new notion of retailing. They had departments within a single store where one could go and shop versus going to individual shops for all of the different, uh, all of the different. Uh, each city built great libraries. Uh, of course, um, the uh, Bodleian uh, complex, the, uh, the original library here, and the new one here, and the uh, Carnegie Library from 1902 by William Mahern, uh, luckily and very fortunately well preserved and, and still very much used. Uh, I read something that was very interesting to me, and that is that right now the library system of Oxford universities have four, four and a half million books, uh, and that is basically um, a test for it is a, a testament to the far-sightedness of a Sir Thomas Bodley, for which the uh, Bodleian uh, Library is named after. Um, he basically uh, set down that every book published in England, a copy had to be deposited in the library at Oxford. And this is still up to this day. So talk about a guaranteed way to make sure that your library grows uh, by volumes. And uh, But again, I think it's very important to realize that certainly nowhere near in comparison, but I always like to look at the turn of the century as the sense of pride and the sense of civic architecture that very much uh, was. By the way, the same architects, William Mahern, did the uh, Goddard Warehouse. Unfortunately, the building that now lies in ruin and will soon be demolished. They will come for Wayne. Uh, great theaters, the Sheldonian Theater, uh, and uh, of course the Civic Theater downtown and the uh, Boys Block, uh, where in a sense the cities came and in very much in the same way, although I will show you the end uh, uh, auditorium, in many ways each city uh, became involved in the arts. The arts is a part of the university. Parts as part of, if you will, the citizenry. And uh, if one looks, one also can find art in, in, in the buildings themselves, something that I think is very important for us to realize when we're talking about the relationship of art and architecture. One of the great crests over uh, one of the colleges, uh, I think maybe All Souls, uh, but also one finds if one looks close enough in downtown, one see this wonderful stained glass on uh, West uh, uh, Main Street. And of course, one finds uh, both Oxford and Muncie recreating near the turn of the century. There were fairs. They took slightly different, uh, slightly different uh, images, but nevertheless, uh, we see uh, both communities very much involved in, if you will, having a good time uh, during this uh, uh, period. Uh, interestingly enough, Muncie builds a great railroad station. Oxford does it at the turn of the century. Kind of one of the few flip-flops, of course, Oxford Mills a really nice railroad station in 1990, and uh, once he takes it down in uh, 1991, uh, must say something about, I guess, the sequencing of the historic buildings. Uh, this slide, I think, for those of you that have not been to Oxford but have been to Muncie, and all of you obviously have, shows basically why the two universities are very different because of their relationship, in a sense, with the downtown. The, all of the orange here, in fact, are the different colleges that make up Oxford University. There really is no university. It is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an assemblage of, of colleges, I think 23 in number. And you can see here by the Muncie map with the downtown here that the university, since its founding, has always been very much a distinct and freestanding. And probably these two aerial photographs show it best. It is very, very difficult to separate out, in a sense, the fabric of the various colleges, which are an integral part of, if you will, the street, this being the famous high here. And of course, if one looks at this aerial photograph, which I think Marshall Weaver was sending me this postcard while I was in Oxford saying, wish you were here. Um, and uh, this, of course, is the relationship of the university. And of course, this is the down. 
very typical for state universities in smaller cities, uh, very typical more for the older universities, which were an integral part of, uh, of their uh, and of course it shows this being the relationship of university buildings with the commercial buildings coming up the high, this basically being the relationship along McKinley of university and housing. And these aerial views, uh, interestingly enough, once he does share the historic idea of the quadrangle, uh, it's simply a matter of scale, it's a matter of compression. Uh, if one looks at uh, the idea of the quadrangle, uh, this would be the scale of the typical quadrangle of the colleges, and of course our quadrangle, which is a beautiful place, and I, I think all of us are awaiting the, in a sense, spring, as we all are here in Muncie, but the advent of, of course, the deciduous trees, Coming foliated, but one can see an amazing difference in compression and scale and containment, all those things that we talk about as designers in terms of the creation of place and the creation of space. Interestingly enough, though, on the campus, we can find some buildings that actually I think would almost feel right at home, and I think that's one of the, 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 the nice things about having a campus that, in a sense, represents styles. Of course, Elliot Wall, I think, being the first resident hall, President Hall built on campus. And again, uh, the idea of pound-gown relationships, interestingly enough, uh, the Sheldonian Theater here uh, uh, is, uh, in fact, a rent building. Rent, by the way, was a professor of astronomy at All Souls College in Oxford when he designed this building. Uh, and, of course, uh, the Edmonds Auditorium, both of these very much serve a pound-gown uh, community, both in music and in drama. So there are similarities there. Great libraries. Bodleian, uh, designed by uh, uh, Gibbs, and uh, the Bracken Library uh, design architect, uh, Perkins and Will, with Walter Scholler as architect of record. Very different, but certainly very much of the era in which the universities basically each uh, came of age. And the library would be very prominent. Again, one can find on the Ball State campus uh, examples of buildings uh, that, again, very much are of the uh, collegial uh, gothic, uh, which I think we would all, uh, for the most part, uh, think of as coming out of Oxford and Cambridge, this being All Souls uh, College uh, over here. Uh, and by the way, the gothic, the neo-gothic of the turn of the century and into this century finds itself very much uh, in Muncie. If one goes downtown, one can find both at the High Street and this church and the first uh, Baptist church still wonderful examples of this style, which was very prevalent and, and very much a part of the first quarter of a century uh, in this country, really before the, the uh, modern movement is the first one to really displace the uh, neo gothic uh, uh, The only part of the campus that I think one would actually find a contemporary, if you will, Wall State type of environment would be the science and uh, technology portion of the campus. And one does find buildings like this, obviously built since the 60s and into the 70s and 80s, very much contemporary. And although I think Oxford would very much be associated much more with the humanities, there have been great discoveries, there have been great scientific discoveries uh, in Oxford. So it's very much a university that is still engaged at the forefront of scientific and of engineering uh, as well. And of course, each campus at certain times really gives you a very romantic notion of how wonderful uh, trees and architecture that one actually be from Ball State, and of course this one be uh, from, uh, from Oxford. Uh, we both have our uh, bookstores, uh, this one being the largest in the world here at Blackwell's, uh, this one of course being the village, but both campuses do in fact have that. Both have blue, by the way. Both have uh, botanical gardens, uh, Christie Woods, uh, which we're very, very quickly, I noticed, kind of trying to make into English gardens and more and more losing the original idea of an untouched wilderness, and this being the botanical gardens of, of, of Oxford. Similarities there. The actual college that I was at was Westminster College. It's a, it's a college that moved from London in the 18, uh, actually it was founded in the 1820s and moves to uh, a community about three miles uh, to the uh, uh, southwest of, uh, of, of Oxford. Uh, and it's very much, uh, since the 50s, uh, very much a contemporary uh, school. Uh, I just, I just a few images of it. It is a Methodist school based on Methodist tradition. And of course, Ball State with the philanthropy of the uh, Ball 
Wall Brothers, but I found the outstretched arms to be interesting in these two statues uh, here, one on the uh, Westminster campus and of course the beneficence on our campus here. The relative size I think is kind of shown in these two residence halls, uh, Westminster being about 3,000 and Wall State being about 20,000. The only thing I actually found uh, is both are engaged in sports slightly at a different scale, uh, but of course soccer and, and cricket and rugby being the big three, football and basketball being the big two uh, at our university. And interestingly enough, for you sports trivia fans, Roger Bannister did break the four minute barrier in Oxford back in 1954. Uh, the President's houses I found interesting because they were kind of similar in scale. Uh, this being, uh, they, they by the way call their President the uh, principal, but this is his house right outside the gates, and this, of course, is where President and uh, Mrs. Worthen live here. I think that's, if we could just change, oh, I guess, what do you need to do, change frequency? Yeah. 
video and everything, but actually we find that in Oxford there was a major attempt to intervene and to, in a sense, rebuild as they destroyed. Uh, the reason I say that is that I think these two slides show you very interestingly what is really true erosion. This is a figure field study. I wonder if I could have that focus on this slide. This is a figure field study of downtown Muncie from 1965. This is basically downtown Muncie of today. That is a 25-year erosion of the urban fabric in the downtown. So I guess erosion is a relative term when it comes to how much. And what's interesting is that these slides I showed in, in England a lot. This is basically the Muncie that the Lynns visited in 1920s, about 1925, hand-painted postcard. This is the Muncie of it today to give you an idea of what has happened after the Victor Bruin plan, what has happened after we uh, dealt with the idea. And uh, I, I thought this was interesting too, a walking tour and a walking tour done by MSHT students in 1982. Um, these are, of course, landmark buildings. These were landmark buildings too, but all the ones in the blue are now demolished, which gives you an idea, in a sense, since 1982 in 10 years, how we dispose of our historic fabric within the community, whereas in Oxford, they certainly use that as a major, if you will, tourist attraction uh, in dealing with that. Uh, and of course, uh, what's interesting about that is that we, we uh, there's a little joke that if I'm involved in a project, that's the death sentence for a building. And uh, I think some of you know I was very much involved as a private architect in doing a feasibility study for the McNaughton building, which then became the ball store building to adaptively reuse it as a city hall. I say that because above Westminster College, ever since the 1930s, stood this water tower. This water tower actually became the focal point of a prisoner of war camp. There were actually German and Italian prisoners that were brought over. This was actually used by pilots as a visual marker on the landscape. Okay, so it's been here since the 30s. Tony Costello comes over. I mean, you can give me a break. Boy, don't, don't hire me to deal with the historic building. We, this was actually, my, I have to thank Andrew for this. This was a, I was out of town lecturing when they blew this up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, that's uh, the end of that particular landmark. It was really pretty special. Uh, just a few things about maybe what Oxford has done and what Muncie has not done. Some interesting kind of interventions of very contemporary shopping within the historic fabric. And you can see this here. We may not agree with how the external expression is, but you can see here the way this new shopping center, this uh, Clarendon shopping center, has been interwoven within the historic fabric with a very minimal of it showing on the streets, allowing people to walk under cover uh, between that. Uh, Victor Bruin, one of his schemes, by the way, was for a covered shopping center in the downloads. I'm sorry. And the other thing that they made a commitment to is parking. This is the in another in-town shopping center. This is a six-story parking garage where you can walk directly from the parking into it. Uh, and you can see the relationship here of the multi-story car park. You walk under cover, you get into this skylit wall in the downtown. And once you, of course, in our climate, you deal with surface parking. And so that critical part of the plan was never executed uh, in the downtown, being able to concentrate parking where people feel. Uh, and so what one gets, of course, is a downtown that basically looks like this. I took this on a Sunday, and I think Carmen will, uh, and any of you that have been in Oxford on a Saturday, you could not take this picture because of so many people. Uh, this is on a Sunday when most schools or most stores are closed, but it shows you the activity versus that. However, I just had to pull this slide out. This was actually the plaza soon after completion when I actually thought it was a really interesting notion of, of a downtown place for people to be and for markets and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, that is basically what is in the downtown now. But I think there are some things happening in the downtown. Part of it is based around preservation and the reuse of historic buildings. Two buildings, uh, stands and uh, the walls of the Dunning, which are using funds, public funds, for the restoration and uh, preservation of historic facades. So there are things happening in Muncie, and I think very important. I think how new architecture fits into a, a historic downtown is uh, maybe a, a more difficult question. And I think here are examples of two contemporary buildings, one in Muncie and one in Oxford. The 
dealing with picking up on the historic vernacular windows and so on and so forth. Uh, these two slides I thought I purposely took this one. Uh, there actually is the intervention of contemporary architecture glass and steel in Oxford, uh, and I purposely took this one to show you the SOM Bank building uh, against that. So uh, do not think that there has not been interventions and one would say a, in a sense, negative intrusion. Somehow in Oxford it all seems to go together okay for some reason. Uh, uh, maybe it's just uh, everything that is in fact around it. How we add on to historic buildings I think is always very interesting. Uh, the entrance on to the great Beaux-Arts Federal Building in downtown Muncie and this very interesting contemporary dormitory at St. Edmund's Hall picking up on the historic uh, gabling of the much older original uh, college uh, building here. Uh, but there are examples, and I do want to point out, this being, I think, one of the nicer examples in Oxford of a building that fits in between historic architecture, uh, the Delta, or Delta House uh, had an addition that won the Soho Award last year, uh, dealing with a piece of contemporary architecture attached to a historic house, and in fact, I'm glad to say one of our graduates, uh, Dave Toth, the first graduating class for the art, was the architect. So there are examples in both places of picking up on the idea of materials, picking up on form, shapes, uh, the way apertures are handled, uh, which I think is a very, very important when we deal with that. Mark, it's a very intriguing uh, covered market here. Uh, this showing you all the things that are in it, these great skylight, kind of a city within a city. Uh, but for me, the market that most intrigued me is the market that takes place every Wednesday. If one goes there the other six days, one basically finds this wonderful plaza with housing all around it. The bus station is right through here. But every Wednesday, one comes in and lo and behold, the old historic market selling everything literally from meat to vegetables to clothes to uh, goods uh, appears here. I, I think that's a very intriguing uh, part of it, but fear not, uh, we have a market here in Muncie too, uh, probably just not as uh, historic or uh, maybe not as uh, uh, nature. But we do have in Muncie, I think, a wonderful piece of uh, commercial architecture, the Rose Court building, very much picking up on the English tradition uh, of the inner skylit courtyard, and uh, this building here, I think, is really a fine example of, in a sense, uh, the best tradition of the uh, English shopping uh, gallery. I can't say so much for contemporary office buildings in Muncie, an example here, uh, an example of a contemporary office building in the outskirts of Muncie here, or Oxford, excuse me, uh, dealing with uh, materials, and one, asks, one has to ask oneself about uh, the appropriateness of using historic materials, either in a way that is inherently, in a sense, in the material, or in a way that I'm not quite sure what that all has to do with uh, brick. I show these uh, two slides for a very uh, specific reason. This happens to be a very interesting new development, and if you'll notice, this is the Oxford Scientific Park, and its land is held by Maudlin College uh, for basically scientific, uh, in a sense, corporations. This piece of land was once held by the Ball State Foundation, very interestingly enough, and uh, I just could not help but think of possibly the lost opportunity uh, when one sees what is being built uh, in one place, in a sense, with the university or college acting as a catalyst, and then the other one selling it off to private developers and then simply letting market forces act on that. I thought that was an interesting idea of the role of the university. Uh, other interesting comparisons are food markets. Uh, this is Sainsbury, a very, very large uh, food chain. And very interestingly, I thought the commitment uh, to landscaping, the ability to be able to roll carts out actually on a walkway, get very near your car, was very interesting here. This, of course, is our new uh, Y supermarket out uh, here on 332. And I was absolutely impressed with the commitment to landscape development and to, in a sense, um, uh, disabled accessible architecture. This all being done by, in a sense, a food chain. This is the landscape development between the Wise parking lot and 332 over here. Uh, just a comparison, this was the little shopping center in Botley. The historic idea that you went to the bank, you went to the butcher, you went to uh, the uh, forest, and of course, this was very intriguing coming back here. You can see you can do all that right now within one store, very much 
the idea of the historic idea of market and the contemporary American idea of market, although Sainsbury just about you can do very much the uh, the uh, same uh, the same thing. Uh, they really don't have a Walmart there, but they do have appliance stores and they do have, in a sense, specialty shops. Uh, but much closer in, these have a tendency to be much more within the confines of older suburbs, uh, rather than Walmart's, which pretty much go out on the periphery of that. They don't have village pantries, but they do have the same idea of where you can one-stop shop for your car and yourself. Interestingly enough, if you look at these prices, and you look at these prices and convert them from pounds and liters and so on and so forth, where you're paying 97 or $1.05, they're almost paying $3 a gallon. So be very thankful for uh, your gas prices here in the States, I think as you well know. Uh, just interesting how we use different uh, terminologies for a drugstore as compared to here in the, uh, in the city. And hospitals, of course, there's not a whole lot of difference. Paul Memorial, John Radcliffe Hospital here. What is intriguing is how big hospitals become and how they absolutely dominate their surroundings. And some people may think that the Ball Hospital very much dominates its surroundings, but I want you to show you something from Oxford, and that is one can never again look at the famous Oxford skyline without seeing the new John Radcliffe Hospital. And when you talk about urban planning and urban design decisions, decision to put that hospital on that hillside in view of, in a sense, the entire valley in which Oxford is located has forever more, in my opinion, damaged, in a sense, the historic idea of the Oxford skyline. That's why it reinforces my idea that planning decisions made very early in the process of location, of, in a sense, visually studying what the impact is going to be, is really driven home in these two photographs here. And one can also find out a lot just about systems like healthcare systems, obviously in Muncie and the way healthcare is handled uh, throughout Great Britain. Uh, and also a little humor, I try to, you can't compare apples and apples, so I decided I would compare two drinking establishments, both with an animal in their name, and so the famous perch over here, uh, a pub that dates back well into the Hundreds, and of course, here the uh, turtle bar. If you don't believe me, you can also see the sign here. So, this is the uh, turtle bar sign, and this is the beautiful hand painted uh, perch sign there. Uh, needless to say, housing is always very dramatic. Uh, the, uh, the English are very much dealing, uh, if you will, with a very dense kind of urban housing, uh, and both very beautiful. I think, I think some of the streetscapes from the early part of this century is with the smaller the porch, but having a very definite relationship with, uh, with the street. And interestingly enough, in Muncie, we can even find sometimes um, an, an interpretation of the thatched roof that is brought over and done in shingles. This house at one time was down here on McKinley. Uh, it is now down on uh, Penny Grove. In fact, I'm standing in my front yard when I uh, take these shots, so it's kind of interesting. There is elderly housing in both locations. Again, uh, the fact that my parents are out in Westminster, I become very familiar with this. Um, both very, very beautiful establishments in the sense caring for the elderly. What was interesting to me is the context, and that is that Westminster Village is obviously out in, if you will, the country, whereas this is a part of that elderly housing complex woven again very much into the community. And I think that maybe says something a little bit more about how the British view, if you will, their idea of, of social architecture and the idea of uh, public assisted architecture. I think that's pretty significant. Um, I, t I asked my 88 year old father if using elderly housing as a segue into the cemetery was okay. He said yes. Uh, this, of course, is our beautiful cemetery here. It really is. It's a, it's a very, very wonderful. Beach Grove Cemetery. This is the uh, Botley Cemetery. And I just show you this because it even drives home the idea that even in death, there's a higher density when you get into England. There's a, you know, a greater use of the, uh, of the uh, uh, land here, I guess, if you have it, you, you use it, so to speak. And there's just some interesting things. The allotments are the term for the uh, public, much like our victory gardens used to be. We do have those in Muncie. They happen to be operated by the university out on uh, Everett Road. Uh, but the English really made an investment in their community gardens. I mean, these are real permanent little sheds and so on and so forth. Uh, we don't quite see that. But I thought it was interesting that there are community gardens in both locations. There's a recycling in both areas. There are the whole recycling idea is, in fact, very 
very interestingly enough, the involvement of the public in environmental issues and in planning issues is alive and well in both communities. I show you this here. This group links up to fight the secret road scheme. There was another scheme to drive a major road through the historic part. And of course, most recently in the news here is this. I can't help but share with you just how much the British look at their trail system. This is a wonderful Oxford Jubilee walk. It's a walk that celebrated the 50-year anniversary uh, of the uh, 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 walking clubs. Uh, the trails are incredibly marked. Wherever a trail meets a road, there is an underpass. Wherever a trail meets the uh, water, there is a bridge specifically for that trail. It's an absolute, uh, to me, uh, example of a community's commitment to a trail system. As a runner, I thoroughly enjoy, and I certainly hope that once he sees upon the opportunity of the rails and the trails, because these are issues that countries like England, I think, have been dealing with for a number of years and dealing with very successfully. Very quickly, looking at housing, I couldn't help but try to look at the difference. Uh, teaching technology, I was intrigued with the way, and I'm just going to run through these very quickly. This intrigued me that instead of using wood framing, they actually, this is for housing, they actually concrete frame for their both over crawl spaces but very different and of course this one builds in the traditional method using masonry as a wall bear whereas in this country we obviously typically use so as the, as the house goes up the house basically the exterior skin and everything goes up simultaneously with it whereas with wood framing you build obviously the superstructure and then we shell it out brick being a veneer and this was intriguing to me to in a sense just look at the different ways. They certainly use wood when they get up on the second story, and of course on a two-story house, uh, we simply use wood throughout. Probably the only place there's a similarity is when you get up into the roof construction and you get into that. So when you finish out a house, of course, you basically get this, which appears as a wood house, but the English house in the traditional system finishes out, and then the brick is put on at the last. When they get their shell done, they're basically done. They clean it and they're they're done with the exterior construction. New subdivisions. Uh, Woodland Trails out west of town, a new subdivision here on the outskirts of Oxford. Again, I couldn't help but be, in a sense, impressed with the value of land. And so if land is very expensive, even huge homes very much deal with a very much tight compression. Whereas in the States, we basically deal with acre or acre and a half zoning. And you can see the use historically of the wall, the sidewalks, which we typically do not do. Very much more a rural or a suburban concept versus this one here. And so this is what a house looks like in Woodland Trails. This is what a very expensive, upwards of $250,000 home looks like. Very much more in the English tradition of the, the wall, the front garden being very much uh, uh, enclosed, uh, so on and so forth. I'm going to conclude by simply looking at the two schools of architecture in Oxford. It's at Oxford Brooks, which formerly was the uh, Polytechnic. Of course, you are sitting in the one here in Muncie and in the state of Indiana. Uh, they both have planning. Oxford does not have uh, landscape architecture. Uh, the buildings are both obviously of a contemporary nature. The Polytechnic's really the post-World War II's, now having been given the opportunity about three years ago to gain university status. This is the uh, new addition actually onto the School of Architecture and Planning at Oxford Brooks. Something that's interesting, no matter where you go, studios are universal in their use of corrugated cardboard and in their basic slumliness. Bulletin boards are exactly the same, probably 30% of the bulletin board is exactly the same. This being at Oxford Brooks, this being up on the fourth floor outside of. I'm convinced there's a universal uh, bulletin board maker in architecture schools. The same guest lectures, same announcements, just different times and dates. And very interestingly enough, some of the same uh, techniques being used. I uh, helped in a graduate urban design studio at Oxford Brooks where we developed a profile of an inner city housing project and I couldn't help think back to some of the work we do here dealing with developing profiles of, of uh, historic towns and cities. I was very, very fortunate. I got the honor to lecture at nine schools of architecture and planning uh, throughout England and Scotland. It was a 
wonderful opportunity to share in England what we have been doing here at this college, especially in the field. Some things don't change. I show this only because no matter where I go, my slides are in total disarray. What I am going to show you is that this is my light table made from a box with white tracing paper and a lamp underneath, which I was actually quite proud of. I couldn't bring it back with me, but it was sure good, and I thank Michelle and the other CBP people for letting me, in a sense, uh, use the CBP table. But sometimes uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and I thought about that uh, in making them. I, obviously, I needed, I needed slides. What was also interesting is to find people like Alan Simpson here at the Bartlett School who remind me of colleagues like Michelle interested in community planning, interested in, in a sense, dealing with teaching students about the need to deal with real community issues and so on and so forth. That was, a, that was an absolute a pleasure uh, to me. And most importantly, it was just very, very enjoyable to uh, deal with students, to, uh, to deal with students here at the uh, Bartlett School who are on the Erasmus program. So they represent many, many nations from the continent, from Europe. And it was also very interesting to share, for instance, what our students have been doing with Habitat for Humanity, a whole another hands-on learning. I think that's the value of travel. Uh, this college has a long history with programs started by Mar, uh, dealing with exposing our students to other cultures. Certainly, I felt an honor to, in a sense, share some of the things that we've been doing here at North Habitat with Scott Truex uh, dealing with that. And I think that's very important. I ended all of my lectures, and I think Carmen who sat in on most of them, I ended my lectures with three quotes. I'm going to end this lecture with three quotes as well. They deal with student education, they deal with uh, public education, and then they deal with the city. I'm going to do in a slightly reverse order. I'm going to deal with student education first. Uh, this is a quote from John Lindsay who wrote the forward to Jonathan Barnett's seminal work on urban design called Urban Design as a Public policy. Uh, uh, John, Bar or John Lindsay was the first mayor to bring architects into city government in New York City in the early 60s. Uh, Jonathan Barnett being one of them, Alex Cooper, standing next to all the great designers that have since gone on to help form this in a sense of profession. And John Lindsay wrote in the, in the preface to this book about these architects. I would like to think we're talking about our students who participate in community based work when he said, in the process, I think they became fundamentally different people than they would have been if they had remained within the confines of the architectural profession. Instead of being architects who design buildings, they have become urban designers who can use their design skills in a variety of situations. They can work with politicians, developers, and community groups. They understand the forces that shape the city, and they have learned how to turn them, and they have learned them, and they have learned how to turn them in new and better directions. They have emerged from the crucible of the city as a new kind of uh, profession. The second is on uh, public education, something that I think this college ever since its founding, with our founding dean, Charles Southfield, has made a major commitment. Teaching, research, and service have been the triad of this university. I'm proud to say this college, I think, has really responded. And I think our community-based education program has really tried to foster the idea that an educated public can be a participatory public, that without education and awareness, you really cannot participate. I never had a good quote for this. I went all the way to London, to Oxford, and I found a great quote. And it happens to be from an American, it happens to be from an architect, uh, and it's not from me, it's from Thomas Jefferson. And I think he really wrote about the public education when he said this. By the way, this was on the latest issue of the AIA memo. Um, I know of no other depository of the ultimate powers of society but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion. And the last thing I want to talk about is the city itself. Uh, and I always use a quote, I have used this ever since I had the pleasure to buy Sybil uh, Mahalanagi's book, Matrix of Man, who I had the pleasure of studying with at Pratt. And there's a uh, paragraph in this book that I think says it all about uh, the city, about the thing that the very, if you will, focus of what a lot of us have spent a lot of our lives doing. It says, 
cities like men are embodiments of the past and mirages of unfulfilled dreams. They thrive on economy and waste, on exploitation and charity, on the initiative of the ego and the solidarity of the group. They stagnate and ultimately die under imposed standardization, homogenized equality, and a minimum denominator of man-made environment. Most decisive of all, cities, like mankind, renew themselves unit by unit in a slow, time-bound, metabolic process. And the last two slides are the last people I want to thank. And that's my wife, Carmen, and Andy, and David, my sons. I can truly tell you it's the first time I've ever really traveled with a family. What you don't do is take a train at 11.30 at night and sleep on the train like I did when I was single and traveled from Europe after graduate school. But I can tell you that the richness of traveling with family and traveling with uh, young sons who you hope uh, will really see the value of travel, will see the fact that this is a wonderful world, it's a world that is simply waiting to be found out and explored, truly made this very, very worthwhile and very meaningful to me. I want to again thank the university and, and thank all the people uh, who made this possible.